know all the names that God has? That's what we'll talk about today. Satan labels you. God names you. Gloria Gaither. That's about your name. We're going to talk about God's name today. Hi, this is Jill from the North Woods. The Old Testament is filled with different names for God, and we'll talk about what some of them mean. It's interesting when you go to Israel, and I've had three years of Hebrews, which is not an extensive study of it. What's fun about going to Israel is when you go to these old streets and you hear the Dung Gate, the Jaffa Gate, the different words that you hear around you that to most people are foreign words or words that you don't know the meaning of, or even the names of people, Michael, Nathan, Benjamin. And then when you learn Hebrew, you see the roots of those names and you learn what those names actually mean. In fact, when I was in Jerusalem, I bought this amazing book, How the Hebrew Language Grew. I promised myself I would never get rid of this book. I bought it in a used bookstore. The book teaches how the Hebrew language exists. So essentially, there are three root letters in almost every word in Hebrew. And then every other word is based on those three root letters. I was struggling through Hebrew, to be honest with you. And I'm pretty good at foreign languages. But Hebrew just skunked me in a few ways. But as soon as I read this book and I understood the structure and the system of Hebrew, I aced every Hebrew class after that point. For example, or is light. Tenor is oven. Menorah is lamp. So when you're in Hebrew class and it says, Sam lit the menorah, you get the idea. Oh, I must have lit the lamp. Now I passed every Hebrew class. Nathaniel is two words combined together. Natan, which means gift or to give. And then El. What is that? El. Like God, El Shaddai. So it's a gift from God. So you can see how Hebrew works as a structure. And as soon as you learn that secret, then it becomes this very fascinating look into how people think. For example, Beth Lahem is Beth is house. Lahem means war, but it also means bread. And someone told me in Israel, well, that's because in the minds of ancient people, why do you go to war? It's usually over bread. So that's what's so cool about languages, that when you learn ancient languages and you understand what they're talking about, you can really understand a lot about what people are. And you'll notice a lot of times, too, that in the Old Testament, it will be that Sarah and Abraham get renamed so that they could be the father and mother of a great people. That Jacob is named Israel because from then on, he had a new role. And the way that people looked at God, God had those names, too. Sometimes in the Old Testament, they'll refer to God as Hashem, the name. It's much like the word Ha'aretz, the land. The whole idea of these languages produce what you're trying to refer to. And like I said, I wouldn't think of it as names as we think of names. This is Bob and that's Sally and this is Sarah and these are all different people. When you have a language as old as Hebrew, when you have the actual names of things, They actually mean something. And so we don't walk around and say, I am going to go to the house of bread. That's what the name means. But they'll say a Bethlehem, Bethel, all the, you know, and so that's what's very, very cool about the Hebrew language in general. If you ever get a chance to learn Hebrew or learn more about it, I think it's going to be interesting for you because you'll get a whole new appreciation for the Old Testament. But there's a fascinating exploration and when we're talking about the names that God had in the Old Testament. And people wonder, why do you have so many names for God? And it's almost like names have a role. So when you're talking about the various names of God, they were used in various circumstances. And when you see the word El, it means God, God Most High. Bethel, it's house of God. If you see the word El Shaddai, there was an Amy Grant song, El Shaddai, that means God of power. It's found in Genesis 17, 1. 
There were whole sorts of varieties there for L, and we'll see and we'll talk about a few of them. And some of these names go back as far as Abraham. When Abraham met Melchizedek, the priest of El Eon, that was the Most High God. And you know that that was the very same God that Abraham believed, the maker of heaven and earth. So you can see how these various names come about. It's not that anyone is calling God different names or that it's even some sort of a form of ancient paganism where we had these very names. Even the king of Sodom said, Yahweh El Elyon, maker of heaven and earth. They're just indicating different aspects of God. And so when they call him different names, they're trying to talk about just the different aspects, the creator, the, the Lord, the savior of the people, the various aspects of them. And when we see the word Elohim, which is just another form of El, Elohim, it is a plural word. And to a Christian, that might go, aha, the Trinity is in there. What's explained is that this is taking up all the essence of everything the way that God is. It is the completeness of God. It is meant as a singular word to Hebrew and to Jewish people. It denotes a plural masculine noun, but the idea is that this is taking in everything that God offers us. So when we're looking at all the names that we have for God, Elohim means all of them. It's also the very first time we see the word of God. It's the very first name we see for God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. That word is Elohim. It's monotheistic. It is one God. In fact, sometimes people will, saw, will put the word ha, which is the, the God. It isn't referring to multiple gods. It's more of a theological statement. Some other combinations of El, which I won't try to pronounce in Hebrew, but we talked about Yahweh translating as Lord or Jehovah, same word, Adonai. We knew that one. But then we also have combinations like Yahweh Elohim. And we'll see these names talked about many times. Some other varieties of the name we've seen called Everlasting God, The God, The Face of God, The Lord Provides, The Lord is My Banner, The Lord is Peace, The Lord is Our Righteousness, The Lord is There. People will often say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those are in the Psalms. They're kind of combined together with the title, The Mighty One of Israel, and as Daniel referred to him, The Most High, because God saw God on a great throne. I imagine with his time being in Babylon, seeing God on a bigger throne than the king of Babylon meant something to Daniel. Then there's Yahweh. And Yahweh is the word that when you're Jewish, you're not meant to say. People will often spell it as Adonai, which means Lord, because the name is so holy, you don't say in Judaism, Yahweh. You don't spell it out. Interesting thing I learned from a mystic in the old city of Jerusalem is if you take the Hebrew letters for Yahweh and you stack them from top to bottom, it makes the image of a man. And he told me that that was Hebrew mysticism and how some people believe that that shows the Messiah is meant to be a man, Yahweh. There's Jehovah, which is just a later version around the third century before the time of Jesus for Yahweh. Jehovah and Yahweh are just the same things, just said in a different way. Adonai, I mentioned that just a moment ago, means Lord. It's a very formal term to say Lord, but oftentimes people will replace Yahweh in Hebrew writing with two Ys, Y-Y, but then they'll say Adonai when they say it out. good example of using God's name comes from what is called Shema Yisrael, which is from Deuteronomy 6.4. And it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. But it's not exactly what it says. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is the one. Shema Israel, Adonai, Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Echad means one. So you're saying Adonai. And it says when we say Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad, when you're in Hebrew school or in temple, you're saying Adonai. That's that point. My Lord. 
But that's in the real Hebrew, it says Yahweh in both cases. Yahweh Elhenu, Yahweh Echad. You can literally see the word Yahweh there. So that is an example of how we're not going to say Yahweh, we're going to replace it with Adonai. The interesting one is when Moses came and asked God who he was, he came back and said the word of translation, I am who I am. Say to that people, I am has sent me. It's the end all. It is the name, I am. And it's a play on words when you're in Hebrew for Yahweh. People would know immediately exactly what that name meant. And so when people heard it, they heard Yahweh. Because when God says that, whether it's to Moses or it's Jesus talking about the I am's, people know what that means. And it puts people suddenly back on their heels as they are finally getting exactly who Jesus is. He isn't a prophet. He isn't just a good guy. He is the great I am. And so while I can go through and talk about all the other names that we have, a lot of times they're composites with it. Like there's Sephiot, but that means the Lord of hosts. Elah Yisrael, the God of Israel. Elah Yerushalam, God of Jerusalem. Elah Shemaiah, God of heaven. So you can see how it's going. Hagar used the word El Roy, which God sees me, or the God of seeing. So people personalize these names of God so that they touched on a certain aspect of who he is. Yahweh, El Olam, the everlasting God. And then even Jesus later on called himself, I am, referring back to that moment where God was calling himself to Moses as a play on words with Yahweh, I am who I am. And then at that point in the New Testament, in John 6, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. These are all coming from John, right in a row. I am the true vine. At this point, Jesus is talking to Jewish people, and they were asking him about who he was. They said in 848, they're challenging him. Are we not right in saying you are Samaritan and have a demon? And Jesus explains he doesn't have a demon. He keeps his words. John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And at that point, they picked up stones and he had to take himself out of the temple. They knew what that meant. And so that's a reflection back in that passage with Moses, the word Yahweh. He is exactly who they are afraid he's saying he is. He is the Savior and the Messiah. So in John 18, 7, so he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Chapter 8, Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. Someone brought up this point that that is actually the last I am because it doesn't actually say in the words, I am he. It is just I am. And people thought, this is what this um, person talking about the Bible said, that there was possibly no word he at that point. The translations put it in because the sentence didn't make sense. Are you Jesus? I told you I am. And so then that person considered this to be the last I am. But again, the main point about whether that's true or not, I don't know. I can't read the original language in this. But the idea is that when Jesus says, I am, he is referring back to the words of Moses. There's whole books about the names of God. I didn't want to do that deep of a dive. I just wanted to express how cool some of these names are. Just because, again, it's invoking what people think of God at that moment, are thankful for God at that moment. We can see the nature of God in all of these names, but we can also see the nature of the people who worshiped God at that point when they were calling him by various names. And you can understand a little bit more about how people relate to God by the name that they give him. 
I hope this was at least a good starting point to be informational, to give you an idea about how God names himself and how people name him in the Bible, and that we know that God being so big as creator of the world, savior of all the people, our king, our Lord, can have a lot of names and can have a lot of meanings for those names. So my challenge to you is, can you think about how you would name God? What is the name that you would give God in your personal world? What does God mean to you when you think of him? Is he the God who saves? Is he the God who protects? Is he the God who creates? So for me, I think about God as the maker of heaven and earth. To me, that is the most stunning thing about God, that not only he built all the snakes and butterflies and all the things that exist, the plants, the earth, the planets, but that he made systems so that it could change, grow over time. The planet can adapt to whatever it needs. So for me, the God who is the maker of heaven and earth means a lot to me and has always been the one that struck me the most. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can always subscribe to the podcast and tell a friend. And if there's anything you have to say to me, you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. So if you found another interesting name for God, if there's one that really resonates with you because of that connection you have with God, but let me know which ones strike you the most. And remember, our walk, through time from the beginning to now with God on high starts with small steps.